good morning class so today we have another section from the bible that we are going to do today and this is from the new testament in yesterday's class which was another unit we were looking at the book of job and we said that the book of job is a part of the old testament now the book of job and the new uh, sorry the new testament and the old testament we said together are a part of the bible for the christians now the jews only believe in the old testament right so the old testament is the one that comes up uh, earlier than the new testament and the old testament is uh, also supposed to be the direct words from the god then you have christ coming up and with christ you have uh, the religion of christianity along with the new testament so what we are basically saying is that uh, whatever we did yesterday is somewhere related to what we are doing today right uh, so when we say that the old testament the uh, sorry the book of job in the old testament is about human suffering is about tragic fate is about god's sovereignty and his power his you know his mercy his compassion if that is the world view that we were looking at from the uh, point of view of the jewish religion it also holds true for christianity now for christianity we have to also understand as we will see in this particular um, gospel that you have to understand that you know there are revisions there are uh, some sort of modifications but then christians believe both in the old testament and in the new testament for them the old testament is the word of the god right and uh, as we said christ is the son of god so christ is talk christ teachings are incorporated in the new testament so from that particular background we'll be looking at you know this uh, particular section now another thing that i want to highlight uh, as part of your syllabus we have the sermon of uh, the sermon on the mount and in the sermon on the mount also we have a very small section right so that section is fr uh, from chapter 5 and in chapter 5 we have verses 1 to 48 as we said that the bible is divided into chapters and those chapters contain verses and verses are two to three lines or one or two lines you know any sentences that there are uh, they are called verses so that is how the structure uh uh comes up even in your syllabus so in your syllabus please note that we do not have the entire sermon on the mount then we do not also have you know the entire gospel right so gospel is the bigger set and in that sub in that set you have the subset of uh so to say this particular part which is the sermon on the mount and in the sermon on the mount we have another short chapter right which is chapter 5 and we are only dealing with chapter 5 so we have chapter 1 sorry verses 1 to 48 within the chapter and that is what we are dealing with now uh, looking at your study material also you would find that it gives you the entire background about jewish history about the life of christ and a detailed study of the entire sermon right but we do not Uh, but all of that is not a part of the syllabus so to say you have just verses 1 to 48 so we'll be concentrating on those but i'll also uh, you know to place it rightly that is why it is also given in your study material so that we understand what is the importance what is the significance of it what is going on in the background right what is it trying to do what is try, what is it trying to achieve but we our main focus would be on some on the sermon of the mount chapter 5 verses 1 to 48 which is only a part of your syllabus and uh, 
the other chapters, chapter six, chapter seven, are not a part of the syllabus. Right. So just making those uh, first clarifications before we move on to the class. Now, New Testament, as we said that this is particularly about the New Testament. Yesterday we were talking about the Old Testament. So for the Jews, we have the Old Testament and for the Christians, they talk about both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, with regard to Christianity, Jesus Christ is the only and final authority, right? So Jesus Christ is the final authority with regard to Christianity. Christians believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus himself was a Jew, right? So we'll be talking about Jewish history. We'll also be talking about the historical background uh, for, uh, you know, the New Testament. And we'll be discussing also the life of Jesus himself. So, the, uh, so we say that Jesus was a Jew and the Christian church began its life in Palestine and its first members were Jews, right? So uh, the background to Christianity is in the Jewish religion, right? So Christian church, the church as we know today, begins from, uh, begins in Palestine and begins from the Jewish religion. Now, Jesus Christ never wrote a book, never recorded his teachings. To him, the Old Testament was the scripture in which he saw and heard the word of God. Right. So uh, we have to also understand that the New Testament, as we know it today, was not itself written by Jesus Christ or uh, he did not actually made any changes at all in the Old Testament. Of course, we'll be looking at the political background to this, the historical background to this. Why does he not record his teachings? Why does he, you know, uh, say such a thing that he'll be making no changes to the Old Testament? Right? It is not just a matter of faith that we're looking at. We're also looking at the political historical context of the New Testament uh, in order to understand how uh, this particular, you know, this particular religion and particular sermon shapes up. Now another thing as we had also said yesterday, please keep in mind that we're looking at these as works of literature rather than uh, as religious books only, which means that we are analyzing them, looking at them from various perspectives. Uh, we are not uh, only interested in uh, you know, giving some sort of um, religious analysis of the book. We are interested in understanding how this religion uh, and religious understanding shapes up that society. And as we understand, as you would have probably also heard from, you know, other teachers that the societal factors shape literature just as literature also shapes society, right? So that is the particular relation that we're interested in. We're not only interested in looking at the religious value of the text, okay? So we are analyzing it as a piece of literature. What is it saying? Uh, what context is it written in? And how does it shape the further context in history? So from that particular perspective, we understand that Christ uh, never wrote the never wrote the New Testament. It is the later disciples, it is the apostles, the priests that followed Christ who wrote, uh, who kind of put down the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. So the early people of the Christian church heard the words of Jesus and knew him from the disciples. So the Christian church, as we say, begins with the Jewish religion. The early people are themselves Jews and Jews, these Jews convert sort of to Christianity when they understand or when they believe also in the teachings of Christ. So the Apostle Paul founded churches in Asia Minor and Europe. So these churches do not always exist, right? Even at the time of Christ, you do not have a church, right? 
so churches begin uh, when apostle paul founded churches in asia minor and in europe and along with the old testament these letters began to be read in christian gatherings now um, it is, as we said that it is noted that uh, you know the christ himself does not write anything right he does not put down new rules he does not put down new a new testament and of course for uh, people probably who did not attend the last class what do we mean by testament testament means a kind of a mutual understanding between god and his people right so these teachings uh, this mutual understanding this new mutual understanding was not given by uh, you know was not put down by christ himself but his apostles so as we know that uh, you know probably you would, you would have heard that he chose 12 apostles and one of those was paul and he found the churches now the early christians organized their worship on the model of synagogue worship their psalms were sung the old testament read prayers offered and sermons were given later on they began to read the epistles and the gospels so this is about the historical point of view that uh, now what is the synagogue synagogue is a um, is a formation is a gathering uh, or congregation of about you know of the jews wherein they prayed right so it is almost like a worship place of worship for the jews but of course um, you know uh, since we are talking about very very old times uh, they did not always uh, you know have a place so to say but it was understood that whenever a group of people gathered to worship it can be called a synagogue so it was about like you know 10 people 10 jews if they 10 jewish men if they gathered and if they were worshiping then it could be called a synagogue so the earliest model for the church was also uh, sorry the earliest model for the christians was also the synagogue instead of the church and there uh, they sang the uh, psalm or uh, psalms then they had the old testament prayer uh, they have the prayers offered and sermons were given right so all of these things are a part of the old testament so you see that a uh, early on we do not have the new testament in place so to say and then finally you have epistles now what are epistles epistles are letters and the gospels which come into being so the kind uh, the sermon on the mount that we are looking at is a part of the gospel so let us understand you know this jewish history that we are talking about so the babylonian empire Uh, now you may be familiar with the Babylonian Empire was overthrown by Persian king Cyrus uh, in six, uh, who lived between 600 to 529 BC. He permitted the Jews who so desired to re return to Jerusalem. Right, so we have, of course, you know, the, uh, this is not the exact beginning, but I have picked out sections from history which are kind of relevant to us. Now. so we understand that the babylon empire was thrown up and was captured instead by uh, king cyrus and he permitted the jews who so desired to return to jerusalem uh, now if you uh, kind of understand this you would understand that you know this um, jews were constantly in the uh, they they were being invaded they were being captured they were you know they were being colonized and that kind of a thing was actually having an impact on their religious beliefs on their uh, you know on their condition and it led to you know a variety of impacts a variety of changes in their day to day lives as well as their religion philosophy etc right so this is why we study the historical background or the uh, or we understand what is going on in the societies so as to understand you know how is it really impacting the literature of the times so the scribe named uh, the scribe Ezra who was a Jew appointed uh, uh, was appointed as the governor of Judea by the Persians 
who brought about a great religious awakening among the Jews, right? So this uh, now Jewish religion is also undergoing changes, right? Uh, when they are faced with these new rulers who are coming up, they try to sort of impose their teaching. Some, cho uh, some do not choose to, you know, interfere in the religious affairs of people. But as we have been, you know, uh, as we've been uh, aware that, you know, whenever some alien force or whenever some foreign force enters a new place, they come with their own, uh, you know, ideas and backdrops. Now, if they are also coming with an intention to rule over the, those people, then you can also understand, you know, that um, the differences would be much more pronounced and exaggerated. So during this period, the writings contained in the Hebrew Bible were collected. So as we said, now the uh, the scribe, right? Who are the scribes? They are people who write. Uh, so uh, he contained, uh, you know, so he began uh, a religious awakening among the Jews. And now the writings contained in the Hebrew Bible, which is, you know, the uh, Hebrew version of the Bible, were collected according to the Bible out of the Babylonian captivity came three great establishments by which God blessed the world. So these were the three great teachings from the new religious awakening that were now put down in the Hebrew Bible. So uh, first was that Jews were never idolatrous again. That means that there were uh, there was to be no idol worship. Uh, now second, the synagogue we said, uh, which is the place of worship for the Jews was born and from the synagogue came the church. So uh, we have already spoken about this. Now the third point is uh, that out of the agonies of the days of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah came the predictions by the prophets of the more glorious Savior and King whom, go, whom God would send his people to save them from their sins and bring to them everlasting hope and righteousness, right? So this is something that we uh, are talking about, we were talking about even yesterday, that throughout the Old Testament, there is the promise of the Messiah, of the Savior, who would come and redeem humanity, right? So in that sense, Christians believe that Jesus Christ was this Messiah, was this Redeemer of humanity. Now the Messianic hope became stronger and more gloriously received as the centuries passed. Right, So you can understand that these people are constantly being uh, exploited. They are being ruled by alien forces. So, and uh, they are facing a lot. Right, So in that sense you can understand that religion and faith becomes all the more uh, you know all the more important to them and that sort of a hope right that some force would come some messiah would come and rescue them and save them is something that um, that belief grows stronger in the wake of the historical background of you know uh, constant invasions that they are facing so the 400 period between the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament marks the rise of the Hellenistic Empire. So the Hellenistic Empire be begins between this Old Testament and the New Testament. Then Alexander the Great, of course, uh, you know, you would know about Alexander the Great, spread, ab uh, spread abroad one culture and one language. In the inter-biblical period also arose the might of the Roman Empire. Right, so we are looking at the Roman Empire. We are looking at, you know, what is the impact of the Roman Empire on to the Jewish religion? Okay. So after the conquest of Alexander the Great and his death, which happened in 323 BC, Egypt ruled Judea for about 100 years and then it fell into the hands of Syria. The Syrian king forced the Jews to idols, right? So you see that, uh, you know, there, there are constant changes that are happening with every ruling authority. Now the Jews revolted, 
they defeated the Syrian army, won their independence in 130 BC. Before long, however, the people became divided into parties or sects such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Right? So we'll be talking about who are the Pharisees and who are the Sadducees. Um, so, uh, you know, after they have gained their independence, after the Jews had gained their independence, the people uh, themselves became divided. And a dispute arose between the two claimants to the throne. And Rome, which acted as the arbiter, took advantage of the situation to make himself the master of Jerusalem and forced the Jews to pay tribute. Roman go governors appointed by Roman kings ruled Judea. There were frequent insurrections which culminated in the great Jewish war of AD 66. Right? So you see now uh, still after they gained independence, what happened is that um, they, the people were divided and um, when the people were divided and they were, you know, uh, in a dispute regarding who will take over, then as the arbiter, Rome, uh, Ro the Roman Empire entered and uh, instead of settling that dispute, they kind of, uh, you know, they kind of took over. Now, uh, Roman kings ruled Judea and then you have the great Jewish war in AD 66. After a long siege, the Roman general Titus took Jerusalem in AD 70, burned the temple, massacred thousands of Jews and enslaved thousands of others. Right? So you can see how is the Roman Empire treating the Jews. And in the wake of this, you can also understand what goes on in the mind of people, how, uh, you know, how well and how desperately would they be looking at and wanting a Masiha who can uh, kind of save them from all this uh, slaughter and onslaught that is going on. Now the Jewish nation was destroyed but not their spirit. Dispersed throughout the world, they established synagogues wherever they went and their rabbis or doctors of law continued the teaching of the mosaic lane. Right, so mosaic is the law of Moses. Now Moses is another, uh, you know, religious figure that we um, that we'll be talking about. And then you have rabbis. Uh, so the Jewish nation, right? So Jewish nation is destroyed. It is taken over by the Roman Empire, and uh, you know they are facing a huge calamity, but their faith is not broken, and they are spreading their religion to a lot of places now. So it was at the cost of terrible suffering that the Jews remained faithful to their religion. So you can understand, you know, that uh, there are people who are also interfering. The rulers are also interfering with their religion, but they continue with their religion, but they, uh, you know, remain faithful to their religion. And this happened in the wake of great historical changes and in the wake of great suffering, right? So you can understand how important is the religion to them. So their history after AD 70 is for most part a long succession of persecutions where trading and money lending were the only pursuits open to them. So as we know that the Roman Empire took over and the Jewish people were, you know, the Jewish nation as uh, it uh, existed initially was destroyed, but the people even then in the wake of all the suffering continued to practice and preach their religion and uh, you know you can understand that there is a lot of violence going on people are persecuted and killed and you know they have little options uh, that remain with them so the jews were kind of again they were um, you know they were actually marginalized they were relegated to the backgrounds they were constantly uh, they were constantly uh, exploited and oppressed. But in that suffering also, they continued with their religion. So this is the backdrop in which we see uh, Christ coming up. Now we said that the Sadducees and the Pharisees had their um, dispute. So let us understand who are these people. So after the Jews had been taken captive, most people were scattered in many different places. Some were assimilated to the locals, while some kept their original beliefs and culture. In Jesus' times, there were four styles of living among the Jews. Right? So we said that, you know, 
uh, some uh, they were taken over, they were taken captive and people believed in different things. People were divided. So some people assimilated with the locals while some kept their original beliefs and culture. So the Sadducees were accepted. Uh, they were people who accepted foreign cultures and associated with the Gentile rulers. More than half of the priests were Sadducees, right? So they made a pact with the new rulers, with the people who are taken, uh, you know, captive the other people. They were, and they accepted the foreign rule and the foreign culture. So more than half of the priests and these priests, of course, when they, uh, you know, when they make a pact with and when they are, uh, you know, um, accepting of the foreign culture, they got high political status, right? Because they were friends with the foreign political rulers. Now the Sadducees were serious to their beliefs. They only believed in the books of the Moses and kept the right of purification strictly, right? So they believed in mosaic law and therefore kept the right of purification strictly. Now the Pharisees, they kept observing the Jewish stipulations and laws, but rejected foreign cultures. Right, so you can now understand, of course, why the Sadducees and the Pharisees were in dispute with each other because the Sadducees were friends with the foreign culture. They were accepting of the foreign culture while the Pharisees rejected foreign culture. They were enthusiastic to the law. They despised the people who did not practice the religious rites, such as the law of purification and food. Now, uh, they were also Essenes. They were disgusted with the invading of Greek culture, so they lived in seclusion in the desert. They followed the public ownership policies on property in their living. Right, so some people, uh, some people reject, some people accept, some people withdraw. Right, so Essenes were the people who lived in seclusion. They withdraw, or they withdrew from the mainland. Then zealots who opposed and attempted to use violence to overturn the Roman government, so as to develop the kingdom of God. Right, so they uh, zealously try to, uh, you know, they, they even resort to use violence to overturn the Roman government and to establish the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is something that uh, the idea that comes up in the Old and the New Testament, wherein, you know, people are trying to be close to God. Right, so as we understand that in religious belief, it will be of utmost or the ultimate objective will be. Uh, the proximity that the disciple or the believer can esta uh, establish with God himself, right? So uh, they wanted to develop the kingdom of God. They enthusiastically abided by the Jewish traditions and opposed using Greek in the Jewish territory, right? So you can see the four kinds of people, the four kinds of groups that emerged during the time that Jesus is living in, what is the political and social situation during the time that Jesus comes up with his, you know, new revisions of the Old Testament. So you can see that it is in the backdrop of this colonization uh, and suffering and exploitation that, you know, Jesus is really giving his new beliefs. So Okay. In the book of Matthew, which is placed in the New Testament, right? Uh, you have you have the first. So the book of Matthew is one of the first books that are a part of the New Testament, right? So the order of the four Gospels uh, the f is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So there are four versions of you know, uh, of the life of Jesus by these four apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So the book of Matthew is placed first, then you have the book of Mark, then you have the book of Luke and then you have the book of John, right? So this particular gospel that we're talking about, this particular Sermon on the Mount that we're talking about is coming up from the book of Matthew, which is why we are looking at the introduction of the book of Matthew. Now it is not arranged chronologically, right? This uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it is not in the order of time or the sequence of time when they first appear, but it is 
and you know that how the Christian uh, people actually, uh, you know, arrange this particular Gospels. So we understand that Mark is the earliest Gospel ever written. So Mark's Gospel was the earliest one, but you have Matthew coming before Mark in the way it is arranged. So of course it is not arranged chronologically. Then you understand that uh, you know every gospel what is what what do we get from these four gospels these four books we have in every gospel the, uh, the life and the work of Jesus Christ is talked about so gospel what does gospel mean it means good news now the current meaning of the word gospel is the thing that may safely be believed each of the four gospels is does a message of good news relating to Jesus Christ which may safely be believed, right? So you can understand that Gospels, as we now uh, said, that is uh, that they talk about the life and work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was understood to be, you know, the savior. And uh, so this is the good news, right? So in that savior, the uh, in for that savior, the life of that savior is described in these four gospels in these four versions and we are talking about the book of matthew we are talking about the gospel of matthew so uh, although we said the life and work of jesus christ is described in the gospels the gospels are not biographies right so they contain the life and work they contain the biographical information of jesus christ but the Gospels are not biography as such. They are actually books written to, by convinced Christians to comment and explain their faith to others. Right. So people who believe in Christianity um, are, uh, you know, refer to the Gospels and this is uh, by using the Gospel, they actually help other people to understand and explain their faith. Now, they are unlike any other type of ancient literature. In fact, there are no literary parallel to the gospel in ancient writings. So as we said about the book of Job also yesterday, that it contains a variety of forms. The Bible itself as a piece of literature contains a lot of forms and, uh, you know, so a vast amount of literature, a vast amount of stories, songs, poetry, you know, prose, Everything is there in the Bible. So in that sense, it is a great literary work. So you see that, you know, the Gospels are also uh, unlike any other piece of literature, historical piece or ancient piece of literature, because they contain both the history the uh, of the historical information and they also can they are also the documents of faith, right? So they have both historical information and their documents of faith, which is unseen uh, in other uh, in other uh, ancient literature. So every why do we have four Gospels? Every person, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, describe the life and work of Jesus in their own interpretation and in their own way, which is why you have four distinct four different portrayals of Jesus that we get. Right. So now we'll be talking about the outline of the life of Jesus. Now again, I've not put down the entire life uh, of Jesus, uh, but we're looking at some of the important facts from there. So uh, Jesus was the son of Virgin Mary. Now this is something that you might have heard. Born at Bethlehem of Judea, shortly before the death of Herod the Great, the governor of Judea. Right. So it, it is in 4 BC that we have the birth of, uh, you know, about 4 BC that we have the birth of Jesus, and he's the son of, of Virgin Mary, and he's born at Bethlehem. So he spent his early life in Nazareth in the district of Galilee, where he worked as a village carpenter. Right. So he worked as a village carpenter and he was living in Nazareth in the district of Galilee. So when John the Baptist, now baptism is one of the rites of purification that the Christians indulge in. So you have, you know, the um, 
you have John the Baptist who begins to preach beside the river Jordan about AD 27 and Jesus came and was baptized by him. Right? So Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He and uh, Jesus immediately received the gift of the Holy Spirit, commissioning him for his work. Right. So Holy Spirit is one of the ghosts of, uh, you know, uh, of God and the Holy Spirit uh, gives to Jesus, you know, this um, this idea, the strength to uh, stand by Satan's inducements, right? So Satan, as we said, is the opponent of God and Satan is the one who is the evil figure. So who tries to tempt everybody, right? Who tries to tempt man as he initially did. And therefore, you know, uh, you see that the Holy Spirit gives strength to Jesus to carry on with the message of God and also to resist the temptation offered by Satan. So uh, based on that strength that the Holy Spirit gave to Christ, he was able to resist the temptations by Satan and uh, his calling was to spread the message of God between, uh, sorry, among people. So he then commenced a ministry of preaching and healing, right? So this is what Jesus was interested in, uh, in preaching and in healing and he uh, you know, he started a ministry for that. So uh, in his district where he was working, which is in Galilee. So this was preceded by a period in Judea and included visits to Jerusalem. It concluded with the journey to Jerusalem, which culminated in his arrest and death at Passover time. Right. So we understand uh, that at the end, uh, you know, you have um, Jesus who is crucified. Right. So you, of course, have also this idea of resurrection of Jesus, right? That he uh, woke up from uh, his death on the third day, right? But we are not really looking at that because uh, it is not really of relevance to us here. So you understand that his death, um, you know, before his death, he was also uh, constantly, uh, you know, moving to and fro and he died in uh, you know on his way to jerusalem he was going and uh, when jerusalem in jerusalem he was arrested and uh, killed as a part of the roman punishment of crucifixion so jesus's message was concerned with the good news right as we said that the old testament is constantly talking about the good news so Jesus's message is also concerned with the good news of a savior coming up to save them, to save humanity. So Jesus thought that his hopes for era was already dawning. He looked forward for the future consummation of God's rule with himself as king. Right? So Jesus was also understanding, um, you know, was also uh, sorry, projecting that this era of the savior of, you know, people again being close to God would come up soon and he would be, uh, you know, the, there would be God's rule again and he would be the king. But the coming of God's rule was not to be seen in military victories, right? So we were saying that, you know, there were constant onslaught and people were being killed and, you know, Roman Empire with a strong military forces took over the, uh, took over the Jews. But Jesus does not talk about a military victory over uh, the foreign forces, right? What is he talking about? He's talking about healing and preaching as the ru the new rule, as the new value, the new ethic that is coming up and the preaching of salvation. So healing, preaching and preaching of salvation is being talked about. God was already acting in the ministry of Jesus. Now Jesus called them to repent of their sin, right? So this message he was uh, spreading and uh, with the spreading of this message, he was looking forward to people to come and join his mission, right? So this, uh, for from those people, what did Jesus expect? Jesus expected that they repented of this sin. He offered forgiveness to the penitent. So the uh, people who were repenting 
uh, Jesus was offering them the uh, offering them forgiveness, and he summoned men to become his disciples. Right. So Jesus wants that in his ministry, wherein God's rule is coming up, therefore people should follow uh, that God's rule, and they should follow him. So to accept the good news of the rule meant accepting Jesus as master. Out of the many who responded, Jesus appointed 12 men to be the leaders of new people who were to replace the old Israel with uh, rejected the message of God and to associate with his missionary work. Right. So what is happening? Jesus believed that you know the old Israel people, the old Jews, have actually. Uh, you know, misinterpreted the religion, corrupted the religion, corrupted and rejected the message of God, and therefore, you know, new um, this new, new uh, ministry is new, needed. This new uh, sort of understanding is needed, and therefore, he appoints to spread his message of the kingdom of God. He appoints these twelve people who will be uh, spreading his message and who will or who have accepted. Jesus as their master. Now Jesus taught his disciples a new way of life. It is summed up on in the Sermon on the Mount. Right. So the new way of life that we're talking about that Jesus was bringing in is or actually given in the Sermon on the Mount, which is a part of our course and which is what we are going to read now. So he took a uh, he talked about the Old Testament commandments. So in the Old Testament, you have the ten commandments from God, right? So he's talking about those commandments. Now they are about the love of God. They're about the neighbors, and uh, this is how he uh, change. This he is now going to talk about revisions in those, as he understand that uh, the Jews have corrupted the original message of God. Now Jesus taught with such self-confident authority that men asked who he thought he was, right? So Jesus was so authoritative, so self-confident uh, that people were wondering that how did he have such an authority? Uh, what did he think of himself? Now some people dismissed him as mad. Others were prepared to see him as Masiha, but when he showed no inclination to lead them to war against Rome, they turned away from him. Right? So you understand that the, that it is in the political background that it is all happening. Right? So what are Jewish people looking forward to? The looking forward to the Masiha as somebody who would replace the Roman Empire. Right? So they're looking for a military victory. Uh, so uh, but instead, what is Jesus offering? Jesus is not talking about military victory. He's talking about the message of God. He's talking about healing and preaching and uh, salvation, right? So you understand that some people support him, some people and uh, probably understand that his kingdom of God is, you know, what they should be looking forward to. Some people dismiss him, some people uh, turn away from him. So this is why in this entire backdrop now we understand that D Jesus did not claim the title of Masiha openly. He preferred to speak of himself cryptically as the son of man. So he did not uh, accept the title of Masiha openly, but he spoke of himself as the son of man, uh, which is a phrase that he took from Daniel and filled it with new content. For him, uh, the son of men, uh, man meant a figure who would one day be invested with power and glory by God. Right. So he will uh, he understood himself as uh, you know, the son of man and he would be invested with power and glory from God eventually. But who was for the time being humble and unknown, destined for suffering and death, right? So this is how Jesus projected himself, portrayed himself. Only to his closest disciples did he reveal that he was the son of God in a unique, intimate manner, right? So openly he did not, uh, he never accepted the title of Masiha, but um, you know, it, to his own people who actually believed in him, he revealed that he was the son of God and he shared with them the privilege of addressing God in the prayer by the name of Abba Father. Right. So we understand that God is called as the father and Jesus is called as the son of God as he spoke to his closest disciples, although openly in the wake of, you know, the historical political background, he never accepted himself as the Messiah. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was involved in conflict with the religious authorities, mainly because of his scorching criticisms 
of the man-made traditions which diverted men from the real purposes of God's law. So, uh, you know, now we understand that, of course, the kind of backdrop that Jesus is coming from, uh, he is in conflict with religious authorities because what he's doing, he's reinterpreting the message of God, right? And uh, as we can understand that, people would not be very happy with that. So he's in constant conflict with the religious authorities. Uh, he attacked the hypocrisy which substituted tradition for the law of Moses, right? So uh, he understand, uh, he understood it that, you know, uh, the law of Moses, which is actually um, something that people had to abide by, was actually substituted, corrupted by the, uh, by the Jews and they substituted tradition for the law of Moses. So uh, the kind of claims that he was making, his religious claims, his claims that he was the Masiha, um, actually uh, spurred the Jewish leaders to arrest him. They feared that he might be the center of popular uprising against Rome, which would lead to grim reprisals and the loss of their own positions. Right. So now, as we understand, you know, there probably there are two ways to fight uh, some alien force. Right. Uh, either you consolidate your mass appeal. Right. You uh, actually uh, make a lot of people come together, unite them, unify them, uh, actually, uh, you know, dev sort of uh, give them a different way of life, a different way of looking at things, a different way of thinking, right? Or you can have a military victory. So probably what Jesus was actually doing was giving a little, uh, giving a new way of life, a little different from, you know, what they had seen up until now and uh, the Romans feared that Jesus would become popular and uh, there would be a mass uprising from the people and they will uh, then lose their own positions. So Romans capture him, arrest him and finally we have Jesus having his last supper and uh, now when the, you know, so he undergoes a trial after his arrest and after the trial, when he, uh, you know, when um, there in the trial, there are not enough witnesses against him, but after, uh, you know, he has to make the statement. He has to force uh, this statement that he's forcefully making the statement that he's the Masiha, which is regarded as blasphemy. Right, blasphemy meaning something that goes against, you know, a, a sort of a statement that is uh, against, uh, you know, religion, against God. So he says that he is the Masiha, which of course his people knew, but uh, it was considered as blasphemy and therefore he was crucified. Right. So this is how we understand the life of Jesus. Now coming on to the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, I hope now you've understood, you know, the life of Christ. Uh, what is it, you know, doing? Uh, what is the political background? And on the basis of it, we'll un try to also understand the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, we said, uh, of course, class, again, to remind you that we have only chapter five in our course. And from in chapter five, we have verses one to 48. So the words of Lord are found on the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount represents new laws and standards for those who want to enter the kingdom of God. Right. So we said that Christ is talking about the kingdom of God and the new standards and laws that has to come for, uh, are being talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Now Jesus shows his followers how man ought to live, not simply according to a set of rules, but by a minor revolution of attitude and outlook right so the 10 commandments were giving some some 10 rules for people to live by right in the old testament but we see that now uh, jesus is sort of talking about a mini revolution in the outlook and in the attitude of people themselves so the glorious thing is that having set a seemingly impossible standard now a lot of uh, you know debate goes on about um, the kind of things that Jesus said 
practical, whether they are, you know, whether they are applicable to the real world or not. So we understand that, you know, uh, these impossible standards are being talked about. So uh, now we're talking about the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. The first eight verses uh, in chapter five contain eight short sayings. Now what uh, these short sayings are the Beatitudes, each in the same form. So uh, you have when you would be reading the Sermon of the Mount. I hope you've kind of looked at the PDF that I sent. You would have understood that there are, uh, you know, these statements that are uh, made in this vein. Blessed are dash 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 for uh, this. So these sayings declare who is to enter the kingdom which is coming. So we are talking about who uh, are the people who will be entering the uh, kingdom of God and these people uh, are defined in the beatitudes. Now God will then reverse the positions and judgments which men have made for themselves in the world and the last will be the first and the first last, right? So it is automatically talking about a reversal of, uh, you know, the hierarchy that the last people, the people who are, we understand as the weakest, as the, you know, as the most marginalized and most exploited in society will be the first, will be the ones that will be the first to enter the kingdom of God and uh, the the most powerful of people will be the last to enter the kingdom of God. So there is thus running through these things, the contrast between present appearances and the future reality. So in the beatitudes, what do we see? That uh, you have a contrast between what is going to come, right? What is in the future in terms of who will enter the kingdom of God, which is something that they are not seeing in the real world as being uh, practiced today. Right? So in the real world today, the most powerful are the blessed people right? in that sense. But uh, what Jesus is saying that, you know, uh, these people who are seemingly not blessed today will be blessed in the future in the kingdom of God. So a beatitude is a declaration of blessedness with Jesus attached to certain virtues and conditions. We'll be talking about what are these beatitudes and what are these conditions? So they have eight e different elements of excellence and they do not represent eight different individuals, but you know, these elements of excellence, these eight qualities that he's seeking uh, from people who can enter the kingdom of God are to be incorporated, included in one and the same person. So they are an analysis of the perfect spiritual well-being, a summary of what is best in the in the field which is unable, uh, which is attainable by man. The truly happy ones or the blessed ones are the poor in spirit, that is who recognize the spiritual poverty of self-reliance and learn to depend wholly upon God. Right, so this is how it is defined in the Beatitudes, which is talking about the eight qualities that people should have in order to be able to enter the kingdom of God. And these uh, people should wholly depend on God. These are the people who would realize that they are spiritually poor unless they are in the shadow of God. Right, so let us look at these. Um, let us look at these Beatitudes. Uh, I think probably. Yeah. So this is where you have the beatitudes. Now um, he this is the, uh, the these are the eight qualities that we're talking about. So be, in the beatitudes you have blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who persecuted, who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you 
and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right? So as you can understand, probably from this uh, reading this beatitude, that it is the people who are meek, it is the people who are mourning, it is the people who are hungry, right? Um, so basically the sections, the exploited oppressed sections of the uh, sort of qualities that are not really understood as the best of qualities or strong qualities or strengths in people. That is what he's talking about. These people who may not be understood as the best of people now in their qualities, you know, the God will accept them because these are the good qualities that somebody should have. And in the uh, verses 11 and 12, you can see that he's talking about persecution, that prophets before him also who, uh, you know, talked about the message of God were persecuted, were killed, right? So uh, anytime you would try to talk about the right thing, you will face the consequences. That is what he's saying. And now, uh, you know, those people also who will be killed, who will be insulted because they follow the message of God, right? They will be blessed by God, right? So he also understands that he is talking about, you know, these uh, people and they uh, and, you know, these new teachings and he understands the threat and danger that he's undergoing. Uh, and therefore, he says that people who will be persecuted, uh, you know, for believing in me will also be uh, entering the kingdom of God. So the qualities that he talks about here uh, in terms of those who mourn, the reference is to those who are under the conviction of sin or who sigh and cry over the sinful state of the world. Right. So we understand that uh, Christians believe in uh, in the book of Genesis, which is again in the Bible. They believe that, you know, um, everybody is the progeny. All of humanity is the progeny of Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve had committed the sin and based on that original sin, you have, you know, the entire, uh, they are condemned from heaven to earth, right? From the Garden of Eden to earth and in the, uh, and then on earth, everybody, because they are born out of the original sin is sinful. Right. So people who cry over the sinful state of the world, that humanity itself is deeply rooted in sinfulness, will be comforted by faith in their hearts and by God when his kingdom comes and his will is done. Right. So we understand uh, that, you know, Christ is actually coming up to save that uh, safe man from self his sinfulness. The meek who is the unselfish, uh, those who withstand gently the censoring of others for righteous causes, the word inherit implies membership of God's family. Right? So the meek people, the unselfish people who uh, withstand great suffering for uh, the cause of right or uh, righteousness will also be members of God's family. The earth, the new earth where in dwelleth righteousness. Right, so this is the new earth that this is the new kingdom wherein uh, righteousness prevails, which Jesus is talking about. So Moses who was the leader of the Israelites in the Old Testament is described as the meekest of man. Right, and when we say meek, we've also understood that meek is one of the qualities that uh, is advocated, that is, uh, you know, seed by uh, is sought by um, Jesus. Now, for he patiently endured the rebellious attitude of the Israelites for 40 years, Jesus promises that such people will inherit the earth. Now, hunger and thirst after righteousness, those who pray after uh, for righteousness, eagerly desire for the coming of God's kingdom, just as the starring thir thirsty man prays for food and water. Right? So you understand he's talking about all of these people in terms of how will they be righteous? How will they be good people? How and therefore being good, being righteous, being you know unselfish and uh, speaking for the cause of righteousness, they will be entering the kingdom of God. 
Now again, the merciful will be treated with mercy by God. So uh, then the pure in heart, the people who have purity in their essential being are forever blessed and they shall see God in the age to come. Right? So the pure people will also be, uh, you know, they will also be a blessed by God. And then we have the peacemakers, right? Peacemakers, which is the reference to those who in Christ make peace between God and man by bringing man to accept the message of gospel. Right? So man has to now is, uh, understand the message of the gospel and people who do that, people who spread the message of the gospel are uh, actually the peacemakers between God and man and therefore they will also be the blessed people. So the sons of God, they are the true children of God as they use every opportunity open to them to effect reconciliation between others who are at variance, right? So this is about people who are the true children of God with who will always reconcile, uh, you know, the warring parties, right? So they are the sons of God. Now um, of God, now Pharisees view of the children of God being the natural descendants of Abraham, the patriot, drastically clashed with Jesus's understanding. Right, so you can see that there are, you know, uh, there are major revisions or major uh, oppositions that uh, are there between what is understood traditionally and what is uh, Jesus saying. Therefore, you know, this religious conflict and therefore this constant threat that is posed to Jesus. Now, uh, in the final beatitude, this is meant for those who are willing to accept the persecution for righteousness sake, persecuted because of their obedience to God, which they've learned by the commandment of Jesus, right? So Jesus, as he's already talking about in the final beatitude, as we saw that, you know, um, that if they believe in Jesus, if they believe in the true message of God, they can, uh, they will, and if they stand for the right, they'll be persecuted, right? So the likely attitude of the world to the gospel is, gospel is also hinted at, right? So Jesus is already talking about, you know, how people will not accept the message so easily, how they will retaliate, how will they persecute people who are going to believe in the message. So the Christian is represented in the New Testament as one liable to be persecuted, right? So we understand that uh, Jesus is already facing this threat of persecution, right, from the Roman Empire. So he also believes, he also can see that the other people who believe in him, who believe in Christ and the true message of God will be persecuted, right? So the disciples are to be uh, to be rejoicing and glad when they suffer as disciples of Jesus because the, their suffering is blessed and they will have a role and they will have a part in the kingdom of God and therefore you know this suffering this persecution will be finally rewarded by God and therefore you know this is something that they should be seeking or looking towards. Now this is some phrase that you know you have the Christian verse, uh, witnesses this is you know coming up in phrases 5 uh, in chapter 5 verses 13 to 16. So here he talks about the salt and the light. So the two simple metaphors powerfully describe the profound wholesome influence the kingdom citizens will exert upon society, right? So now the, these metaphors, the salt and the light are used for people who will uh, spread the message of God and what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of influence that will they have on society people who will be in the kingdom of god what kind of an influence they will have on society is uh, you know talked about through these metaphors of salt and light so israel had been likened to salt the church is the new israel called because the old israel had lost its taste so as you understand as we understand that salt you know without uh, without salt, the food is tasteless. Therefore, you know, the comparison is made between the Israel, which is which has become the old Israel, which has become saltless, which has become tasteless. 
So the church, the new church will come and it will replace this. So the church is not, it will be, you know, the new salt which will add taste to the food. So the church is not to repeat the sin of the Jews, right? So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that the earlier people misinterpreted and abused, misused, you know, the message of God. God. Therefore, you know, they, uh, the new people who believe in the church, or who believe in the new Israel, who believe in the kingdom of God, will not repeat the sin that they committed. So the saying suggests that just as salt is useful in cooking, preserving and as a fertilizer on earth, so the church has usefulness to God in making the world acceptable to him by sacrifice and intercession. Right. So uh, by sacrifice, by their intercession, um, you know, these people who spread the message of Christianity will be will be, you know, adding taste will be, you know, uh, will be useful in preserving and conserving uh, and making the earth a more beautiful place to live in. So the kingdom citizen prevents corruptions and sheds light around him. Right. So along with the salt metaphor, you also have the metaphor of light for the people who are a part of the kingdom of God. So these kingdom citizens will also prevent corruption and spread their light around the world. So his good influence will replace empty moral laxity with wholesomeness. Right. So it is the uh, it is the kingdom of God people who are good and they will replace, you know, the um, immoral people completely, right? So the immoral people will be uh, will be taught by the good people will, uh, who are a red, who are a citizen of the kingdom of God to practice goodness and they'll then take over. They'll spread their light. So light cannot be hit as it penetrates the densest darkness. Jesus explained that the good deeds of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven witness that God is also good, right? So uh, light as it does not, uh, you know, as it cannot be hidden, so the goodness of these good people cannot be hidden. God is lighting a lamp by means of the teaching which Jesus is giving to his disciples and the purpose of this lamp is to give light to the whole world. So this light will be displayed to all when Jesus sends the disciples to all nations. Right. So everywhere the message of Christianity will spread everywhere. This good pe these good people who believe in the kingdom of God, who believe in the words of Jesus will go and spread the message of God. Right, so this is what uh, is talked about in verses 13 to 16. Now in the verses of uh, 17 to 20, you have the relationship of the gospel to the law. So the law is the law of Moses, which is being talked about in the Old Testament and it has, you know, the Ten Commandments. So the law was the common Jewish name for the first of the three divisions of the Hebrew scripture, which is the Old Bible, consisting of books of Joshua, to two kings and Isai to in Malachi, uh, sorry, in Malachi in Old Testament, right? So it is a part of the Old Testament. The law is uh, the first of the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible. Now uh, the expression, the law of the pro or the prophets, Jesus is referring to the whole Old Testament, right? So he does not only refer to the first books, but he refers to the entire Old Testament as the law or uh, we understand as the law of Moses. Now Jesus here teaches a very high view of biblical inspiration and indicates clearly that the gospel is founded upon the Old Testament. So the gospel is founded upon the Old Testament and this high biblical view is being uh, what we see in the Old Testament, which is coming up. So many hearers of Jesus could have easily dismissed him as a radical revolutionary bent upon overthrowing the laws of Moses. Right? So you understand for that period of time, what is religion? Religion is the Old Testament, right? Now, uh, what is Jesus do doing? Jesus is giving his own interpretation, his new revision of the Old Testament. And we also said that what do the uh, what do the believers believe? They believe that uh, the Bible is directly the word of the word of God, 
right so how can a common person come up and say you know that he is um, kind of making some changes in the words of god so you can understand that uh, people are actually many many people are against what jesus is claiming so jesus says that he did not overthrow the cherish belief of the jews as sham right but what is jesus saying as an argument to that is that i am not changing anything in the old testament uh, there have been corruptions by the people and i am only trying to uh, you know minimize those corruptions by actually saying what is the true message of god so he says that you know i am not come to destroy but to fulfill so i am not here to destroy the message of god but i am here to fulfill the message of god so he wanted a correct interpretation of law leaving behind what was the traditional what was the uh, false interpretation by made by the scribes and the pharisees right people who had corrupted the law people jewish people who did not understand the correct message of god and therefore corrupted it for their own vested interest for their own personal interest that is what jesus wanted to correct so he wanted to fulfill rather than destroy the old testament so uh, jesus considered the law of god to be the original divine revelation of law which moses received while on mount sinai and before the tabernacle as god spoke to him right so the uh, jesus this believes in the original message rather than something that the scribes have talked about or the pharisees have talked about he says that i will believe in the original message of the old testament so the scribes agreed with jesus but also added their tra traditions many of them nullified the divine laws jesus selects six mosaic laws right so it is the six mosaic laws that we'll be talking about which jesus selects in this chapter 5 right so he's not replacing the old laws he says he is only making uh, he's only uh, you know uh, portraying them correctly in different words so that people understand the true message rather than the corrupted version that is offered by the scribes and the pharisees so these six mosaic laws are being talked about the law of murder and reconciliation the law of adultery the law of divorce the law of oaths the law of non resistance and the law of love so these are the six laws of moses the six mosaic laws that jesus will talk about in the chapter 5 that on the sermon on the mount so first what he uh, does is to pre uh, present the scribal perversion of the law how the scribes have corrupted the law then he gives the correct interpretation which is logical and how the god intended the law to be understood right so in that um, you know in that structure when you will be reading the sermon on the mount you would have found that you would have you know uh, first He, there are statements made in these terms ye have heard that it was said by them of the old time right and then the statement comes up and then jesus is reply and explanation comes up with the words but i say unto you right so this is the structure that we see so the scribal law the old testament law follows ye have heard and jesus is message is followed by but i say into unto you right so he is putting the scribal message the old message the traditional message and against that he is putting the correct interpretation as he understands it by saying that you know but i say unto you so the law of mordo right so this is given in 21 to 22 verses the law that thou shall shall not kill is the sixth of 10 commandments given by god to the israel through mount moses at mount sinai now this is a part of the book of exodus in the old testament of the bible wherein uh, god gives his message to moses on the mount sinai right so uh, he gives the 10 commandments and uh, the law of murder is given in the sixth of that 10 commandments where it wherein it says you shall not kill or you thou shall not kill and the words following and whoever murders will be in the danger of punishment is the scribal addition taught to the people in the jewish synagogues so uh, 
the law says you will not kill you shall not kill right and uh, the scribal version says they make an addition that whoever murders will be in the danger of punishment right so this is the scribal addition now here the need to have the basic quality of reconciliation or non violence is not stressed right so it simply says that you will not kill right uh, but the quality of reconciliation of making a uh, peace among people and the quality of non violence is missing from this law right so uh, he says that the scribes and pharisees had interpreted the law wrongly by saying that they should avoid killing as then they are liable to be inconvenienced by a trial a smart way of making the law to have no effect right so what are the scribes saying that if you kill somebody then you will undergo a trial you will be punished right uh, which is not focusing on you know non violence which is not focusing on making peace with people right uh, and therefore you know that you will be inconvenienced in a trial you will face you know difficulties so you should not kill right which is uh, you know not a re really beneficial law or really helpful to so to say so whereas the pharisees and the scribes scribes were concerned with the physical act of murder jesus was concerned with the root of human passions that can result in physical murder right so the scribes and the pharisees are only talking about the murder per se right they're not interested in the motives of the murder but jesus is interested in the physical in the motives of the physical murder what prompts people to kill somebody it is the uh, it is anger hatred and malice that prompts anybody to kill anybody so this is something that jesus will focus on and he will say that calling a person raka or idiot or a fool amounts to character assassination the judgment was a local village court the council was the jewish supreme court to cast into hell fire was the prerogative of god so what jesus emphasized here is that anger and contemptuous speaking receive judgment from men and god right so jesus is also talking about you know that you should not be using foul language you should not even call somebody an idiot or a fool because it amounts to character, uh, character assassination and for that you will be judged by men and by god right so you should not practice foul words towards other people now the teaching of jesus so you can see that from the big you know uh, uh, thing of murder that you should not kill jesus is talking about you know you should not even abuse somebody right so if you abuse somebody you will be judged by god right so rather than you know that uh, so you can see how he intensifies the basic or the very minimal of crimes are big enough to have a judgment from god so the teaching of jesus from six, verses 23 to 26 point out how the ordinary human being tries to get out of the guilt or sin the wrong notion is that the sin of anger or even murder is cleaned by becoming more religious so what was happening at the, this point of time that uh, you know they believe that anger and murder can be also forgiven right by just becoming more religious but this is not right as jesus says so jesus says that instead of you know going to worship instead of you know going to the synagogue or the uh, christian uh, church what you should do you should actually make amends with the person that you have had a fight with right so instead of you know becoming religious killing somebody and then thinking that you know in order to avoid punishment i should become more religious you know that that should not be the approach what you need to do is to make amends make peace with the person with with whom you are having the fight so illustrating his directive jesus says for example two men at variance with each other two men who have had a fight with each other um 
each day are ready to sue each other in the court must settle the dispute before they reach the judge and receive harsh judgment right so again he illustrates this he puts an example for this thing that you know if you have had a fight with somebody rather than going to court where you will face you know a big judgment and a big punishment you should actually go to the person who is uh, whom you have had an argument or a fight with and uh, make peace with that person right so this is his reinterpretation of the law of murder then the law of adultery is being talked about in uh, verses 27 to 30 where the scribes say that adultery was committed only by an illegal sexual union right so as they are describing the physical uh, murder they describe that you know the physical sexual union which is illegal which happens outside of marriage is adulterous and this teaching was done to wriggle out of the guilt of their flirting and amorous trifling with other women right so this tribal message that you know you will be punished for uh, you know having an illegal sexual union with another woman um, was made so that you know it, you can probably pass away from you know having just harmless flirting as we say right but jesus says that this seventh commandment thou shalt not commit adultery demands purity of thought as well as abstinence from the above mentioned act right so you should not only not have a sexual union with another woman you should also be you know abstaining from having uh, those thoughts right so abstaining from even thinking about it uh, having purity of thought and action is what Jesus is talking about that even the thought of flirting with somebody is wrong and is where you commit adultery rather than you know just the physical act of it so the thought of you know another woman of uh, you know having an affair or flirting with them is wrong uh, let alone you know actually having a sexual union with them so mental adultery is just as wicked as the act of physical adultery it was taught by jesus in the beatitudes that only who are pure in the heart see god right so you cannot have any adulterous uh, sort of thoughts also because that would impact the purity of your heart and if you are not pure in heart as we saw you will not enter the kingdom of god so man could be ready for any sacrifice of pleasure to achieve the cleansing of thought and will right so this sacrifice this sacrifice of you know uh, of uh, lust should be made of pleasure should be made to actually achieve the cleansing of thought and will now jesus again uh, says that you know the right eye and the right hand both of them are uh, regarded as the most valuable members of the body in christian thought and if these organs if your right eye or if your right hand are instrumental for untrue and immoral acts right so if you're doing something bad with your right hand or with your right uh, eye then you know then one should be ready to sacrifice them to the to be assured to the kingdom of the heaven so if you've read the text what it says is that you know if you're committing adultery with your right eye if you're committing you know some sort of uh, bad deed ill deed from your right hand then you should you know throw that hand away you should gouge out your eye right so this is not right right so you have to uh, be if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven if you want to be a part of the kingdom of god then you shall not commit the, the sin of adultery either in the physical act of it or in the mental act of it now for the law of divorce uh, which is talked about in verses 31 to 32 Uh, Jesus says that I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery now another thing class of course you know these are um, laws and you know religious uh, beliefs that are uh, coming from a very old sort of a, 
or time, right? So in that sense, they're kind of patriarchal also, in that sense that, uh, you know, uh, they do not really uh, probably uh, adhere to our modern ways of life, right? So, uh, but, uh, you know, these are the things that were believed then, uh, that Jesus believed in then. And therefore, you know, we are uh, probably, um, when we look at these things as modern readers, uh, we understand that, you know, all of these things are said in a historical context where, you know, the society was kind of different from what it is now like. So this teaching is repeated later by Jesus again in chapter 19 that, you know, uh, you should not divorce his wife, right? And if you divorce your wife, uh, except for the, uh, you know, if she's committed adultery, then you have every right to divorce your wife, right? But if you, uh, if she's, uh, you know, for any other reason, you cannot uh, give your wife a divorce. So if you do so, then you also make her into an adulteress, right? And that is not done, right? So she will commit the sin of adultery and that is not right. So anybody who would then marry that divorced woman would also be committing adultery. <coughs> right, so to Jesus, marriage vows are so sacred that each married couple is a reproduction of Adam and Eve. Their union is therefore no less indissoluble. Right, so he believes that every married couple is like Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve cannot be separated, which is why there can no, be no divorce between man and wife. So the disciples saw no possibility of obtaining a divorce with divine approval after the marriage had been consummated. Right. So if if you have had, uh, you know, uh, if you have had a consummation of marriage, if the marriage has been uh, consummated, then there could be no divorce. You are, uh, are you cannot actually separate from your wife or your husband. In the later discussion, Jesus concludes with the pronouncement, what therefore God had joined us together, let not man put asunder. So if God has made two people come together, right, in the act of marriage, in the act of uh, consummation of their marriage, they cannot, you know, separate out of their own will in uh, having a divorce. So only in cases of fornication or immorality, if there is, you know, adultery, if there is fornication, if there is immorality, only then, you know, the separation can be allowed. In no other case can separation be allowed. Now, the law of oaths is being talked about here from verses 33 to 37. So in the law of a oaths, uh, it says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths that you have made to the Lord, right? So uh, the scribal law said, now do not break your oath, but keep the oath that you have made to the Lord. So uh, Jesus says, I tell you, do not swear at all, that you should not be making any oaths at all. Do not swear at heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, right? So, uh, so you cannot swear by heaven because it is the kingdom of God. Then you cannot, uh, you know, swear by the earth because God also has his foothold on earth or by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king and do not swear by your head. So you cannot even swear on yourself because you cannot even make one hair white or black. Right? So nothing is in your hands. Everything is done by God. Therefore, you cannot swear on anything. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything or thing beyond this comes from the evil one, right? So instead of swearing on God, on heaven and on earth, on, you know, even yourself, what do you need to do? Uh, you should not swear. What you should do is that you should abide by your word. If you say yes to something, then it is a yes. If you say no to, to something, then it is a no, right? Instead of swearing, you should stick to your word, abide by your word. So there are two kinds of swearing in practice at the time of Jesus. One is a frivolous uh, swearing, right? Uh, as we understand, as we see even around us, that, you know, people swear for everything and anything, you know? So that kind of a frivolous, casual 
uh, swearing and evasive swearing. When people want to, uh, they're lying, but they're, you know, they want other people to believe them, then they also swear, right? So that is evasive. They, they are trying to escape the situation. That is evasive swearing. These two kinds of swearing were popular during Jesus's time. So evasive swearing had been developed into a fine act of lying, right? So uh, you can lie because you're swearing and, uh, you know, because you're swearing by the heaven and the earth, then the people are supposed to believe you. Therefore, you know, this kind of a swearing had become a mode of lying. So Jesus does not want anyone to swear by God or by Jerusalem or by earth or by one's own head. An oath is not needed as every word a man speaks is known to God. Right, so the need of the oath is not really there because you know God knows every word that a man says. So therefore, what a man should do is to swear, uh, is not to swear by anything else, but to stick by his word. That is the law of the oath. How Jesus reinterpreted it. Then in verses 38 to 42, the law of non-resistance is being talked about. Here, he's, uh, here uh, the law says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you, right? So you see that, uh, you know, the initial law, what does it say? That, you know, uh, you should have an eye for eye and tooth for tooth. It is also sometimes called as the law of revenge, right? In Or it is talked about as revenge, right? So instead of that revenge, uh, what is Jesus uh, giving us? He's giving us the law of non-resistance that, you know, if, uh, if there is an evil person, right, if there is an enemy of yours, then you should not resist them. You should not, you know, go away from them. What you should do, that if somebody is striking you, then uh, on the right cheek, you should offer your left. If somebody wants to sue you and uh, take something away from you, then you should give them more. And if somebody wants to go one, right, so, you know, uh, to give them more, to be abundant in your approach. That is what he's asking of people. So by saying resist not evil, Jesus is not implying that anyone is free to allow himself to be trampled on by others, right? So when Jesus is saying that, you know, do not resist an evil person, he does not mean that, you know, every evil person should harm you or exploit you. What he means is that, uh, people are expected to resist taking revenge against an injury, right? So it does not mean that you will not even protect yourself, but you will not take a revenge. So it must always be borne in mind that resistance can only suppress, whereas gentleness may convert and make the accuser, accuser think and change, right? So if you, uh, I think you are already familiar with these ideas in, you know, uh, even in the context of, you know, other people. Probably, you know, we've heard this ab about Gandhi also. So you understand, you know, that uh, what can happen uh, by taking a revenge that it will only suppress the situation for the time being. But what happens with this kind of a passive resistance that we show is that we can make the accuser who, who's the, you know, who's the evil person, he will be forced to think about his actions. So turning the other cheek is not intended to invite assault, right? It does not mean that you're turning your left cheek. If you've been hit on your right cheek, it does not mean that, you know, you want to invite assault, you want to uh, have that assault, but it means that uh, you are willing to suffer personally rather than cause injury to the other person by taking a revenge. Now the coat and the cloak illustrate the ideal Jewish quality of mercy that is not to be strange. Right? So if you, uh, as I said, you know, this, uh, if somebody wants to take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. It means that you have to be merciful. You have to be, you know, generous and abundant in your approach. 
Now Jesus also says that the disciples' hands should be open to both giving and borrowing. This does not imply giving everything that is asked, but it means giving to the needful. Right? So these are common messages, of course, that we understand as a part of a number of religions. Now the last law that we talk about here is the law of love, which is being talked about in uh, verses 43 to 48 in chapter 5. Right? So this will complete our syllabus, so to say, and then we'll be looking at you know, some of the important aspects. So the words of the verse, thou shalt love thy neighbor, were commanded by Moses, but hate thine enemy, were conveniently added by scribes and taught freely by them. Right, so the original law is saying, you shall love your neighbor, thou shalt love your thy neighbor. But the scribes, as uh, Jesus says, have corrupted the law. They also add this thing that you hate your enemy, but love your neighbor, right? But uh, Christ enlarged the meaning of neighbor and narrowed that of enemy by abolishing the race distinction from both. Right. So what is he saying? What, what do we mean by this? That, you know, neighbor would mean not only an immediate person who's living next to you, but everybody. Right. And enemy would mean, uh, you know, that anybody who you have not uh, had peace with or who is not you know uh, really of your tribe even those people you know everybody so he's extending it to everybody either your neighbors or your enemy by actually abolishing that distinction so a neighbor now is every human being and enemy includes only those who persecute jesus's followers for righteousness's sake right so neighbor is everybody and enemy, Jesus says, is the people who want to persecute the followers of Jesus because they're working for the righteousness sake. Then if the enemies, uh, you know, then if somebody opposes that righteousness and kills people, persecute people for that, they are the enemies. But the way to treat an enemy is not to hate them, but to do good for him and pray for him. So such an action demonstrates a relationship with the benevolent heavenly father with God. And this, uh, Jesus says that this is the way to love, that you have to be kind to everybody, do good for everybody, pray for everybody, even if they are wrong. You. So man ought to love the way God loves. For without God uh, partiality, God pours out benevolent care, right? So God loves everybody the same. Therefore, if you want to also, uh, you know, be in the footsteps of God, walk the footsteps of God, then you also have to show that benevolence. You also have to love everybody. So love is more than just a warm feelings to, uh, towards another. It is a good. It is also good action, right? So it is not only about feeling warm and being, you know, um, affectionate towards people. It is also about good actions that you have to do good deeds towards people now god in his love gives sunshine and rain on the fields to both righteous and the unrighteous right so god is equal to everybody god loves everybody equally he uh, gives everybody sunlight and rain uh, does not withhold it from anybody therefore you should also be giving in your love towards everybody jesus exhort his the disciples to overcome evil by good that you have to overcome evil anybody who is trying to wrong you you have to be good towards them the love that jesus's disciples must aim at is moral perfection that you have to be morally perfect right and uh, that would change the nature of evil so later while jesus was crucified and suffering he demonstrated this kind of love by requesting god on behalf of his enemies so when J Jesus himself is being persecuted, right? He's talking about uh, persecutors as enemies, right? So when he himself was persecuted, he says to the father, to God, that father forgive them for they know no not what they do. Be ye therefore uh, perfect, right? So God is perfect in his love. Therefore man should also try to be perfect in his love if he has to 
be closer to god therefore enemies should not be uh, dealt with revenge they should not be dealt with you know evil and hatred they should be dealt with love and he says that god should forgive those people because the enemy the persecutors of jesus are ignorant and therefore they are committing this act but it does not mean that they are bad people and you know they have to uh, jesus asked forgiveness from god on the behalf of his enemies so the point seems to be that the christian behavior must guide his life by perfect ethical standard of the gospel in contrast to the limited standard of the law so the uh, the gospel is the perfect the absolutist standard of moral perfection while law allows for some you know uh, law is not talking about morality right but gospels are talking about moral perfection this is what we gather from whatever we read until now so uh, you know i think that rather than going through these uh, seventh chapters and all because they are not really a part of our syllabus before i'll just you know talk about these debates and the critical interpretation of what is in our syllabus and then if you are left with any time i can go back to you know chapter 6 and 7 which are not really uh, a part of our syllabus but actually uh, tell us what is the end of the sermon on the mount so um, you know let us look at some of the debates regarding the sermon of course class i'll go to your uh, questions in a while after i discuss these debates and after if you know if you have any time left after that i will then go back to uh, you know uh, the 7th and the 8th and the chapters and prayers and you know other things which are not really a part of our uh, syllabus so to say so one of the key points in the debate uh, so what is the debate regarding the sermon on the mount we are looking at the academic or the scholarly or the uh, you know literary debates ag- uh, about the sermon on the mount So one of these key points in the debate has to do with the relationship to traditional Judaism, right? Which is the religion of the Jews. Many Christians believe that Jesus presented a new law in the Sermon on the Mount to replace the old law of Moses, right? So this is what we've been talking about, and this is also one of the scholarly debates that people believed that Jesus is giving a new law, replacing the old law. this reference of going uh, the reference to going up a mountain prior to preaching is considered by many to be deliberate reference to moses on mount sinai fitting with the consistent theme in the gospel of matthew to present jesus as a new moses right so um, as we said that moses received um, you know these ten commandments on mount sinai and jesus is uh, you know also on the mount we are not told which mount is jesus on but he is giving the sermon from that mount right so it seems like jesus is projecting himself to be the new moses by giving that sermon on the mount as moses also uh, gave his sermon from the mount sinai right so this is uh, you know how jesus is equal uh, is saying that he is the new moses this is one of the um, one of the debates regarding the so now uh, some people believe in it some people as we said believe that it is not the case jesus was not replacing moses he was only correcting uh, the message that was misinterpreted by the scribes to talk about the original message of god that was highlighted by moses in the 10 commandments right so the it is believed uh, by some people that he was replacing moses while others may believe that you know uh, it was not a replacement but only a correction so contemporary scholars tend to admit that matthew does present jesus as a new moses but have questioned the traditional christian view that jesus in effect abolished the old testament law while initiating a new testament or a new covenant so some people contemporary scholars contemporary academicians what do they say that 
Jesus did not abolish the Old Testament um, while he made the New Testament. In this view, uh, in this view of the contemporary scholars, Matthew wrote for a Jewish Christian audience that intended, uh, that indeed perceived himself itself as being in an adversarial relationship with traditional Judaism, but also held strictly to most of the Mosaic law. Right. So, uh, what the contemporary scholars believe in that there is an in uh, that is there is an inherent debate. Again, uh, in between what is believed in Judaism and what is believed in the Mosaic law, right? Uh, which debate is what uh, Jesus is uh, trying to resolve rather than giving some New Testament by abolishing the Old Testament. And as we say, you can probably testify to this by saying that, you know, Christians believe in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, another key debate over the sermon is how literally it was meant to be applied to everyday life, right? So we say that the Sermon on the Mount is, as we saw, a, a, a document of moral perfection, right? So whether this kind of a moral uh, perfection can be applied to everyday life of people is something that a lot of uh, people and scholars debate about. So almost all Christian groups have different have developed non literal ways to interpret and apply the sermon, right? So you do not. Uh, so many of the people who now interpret this sermon and uh, apply the sermon believe that you do not have to take it very, very literally. Uh, you have to interpret the message that is being uh, that is being taught there rather than sticking to it word by word. Now on the literally rhetorical levels, let us look at the Sermon on the Mount. So the sermon is nested in Matthew's Gospel, as we said that in uh, in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's version, we have the Sermon on the Mount. So it is placed in the Matthew story of Jesus must be considered. In its context, the sermon is Jesus's Gospel of the Kingdom of God in non parabolic format, right? So it is not, uh, you know, a kind of in a parabolic format. It is not really, you know, the uh, the most important sort of point here, but it is uh, a part of the gospel. It is presented as a layer of evidence that Jesus is the Messiah who has authority. Right. So the Sermon on the Mount is, of course, the canonical text. Right. Uh, uh, in religion as well as in literature. It is a highly debated text. It is highly valued, but it is not the most important in the a book per se, right? It is uh, one of the parts of the book, not an important, not the peak point, so to say, in the book. So, but it is presented as the layer of evidence, as one of the evidences by which we come to know that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, who is the who is the authority, and therefore he can deliver the sermon. So, uh, what we can gather from it is that it it, it contains Jesus's interpretation of the Old Testament, that you know Jesus has the final authority. Is uh, you know he knows what is happening in the Old Testament, and therefore he can interpret it. How can Jesus say that, you know, it is the correct message because he has the authority as the son of God, as the Messiah. Therefore, he can say that this is what God meant, right? This is the correct interpretation and not what you're traditionally believing in. Now, second, because it presented as the truth of the sort of Messiah would teach, right? So uh, another thing about the Sermon on the Mount that it is also giving to us, you know, that sense of how the Messiah would actually interpret the message and it is if the Messiah who is the son of God is delivering the message, then of course it is divine revelation. It is actually the message of God that the Messiah or the messenger of God will deliver. Then again, it is presented as a summary of Jesus's vision of happiness, righteousness, human perfection and wisdom. This is the importance or the significance of um, the Sermon on the Mount. 
as such the contents are presented as an expression of an idea to be thought but a constitution to be instantly applied so if you look at the structure of how it is you know making the argument if we look at the phrases you understand that uh, he is talking about you know the ideas the qualities that men should have but then uh, it is not only you know just saying that okay you should have these qualities it is also demanding from people that you apply to them uh, you apply them immediately to your life right so this is what makes the sermon on the mount so powerful so influential now the guiding metaphor for relating to jesus in matthew is of discipleship or discipleship not legal judgment right so all through this book as we've been saying it is about the fact that jesus wanted people to follow him to be his disciples right rather than you know facing legal judgment facing uh, judgment from god facing judgment from other people or punishment it is about spreading the message it is about being a disciple it is about submitting to god's authority so it is presented then as the foundation upon which the church is built so since it is about discipleship it is about building a following therefore it is presented as a foundation right that the church would then inhabit the followers of god then again it is taught in the mountain in the hearing of crowds to disciples who are called to preach the same message right so the sermon is not told individually to one person right this is what we need to remember it is told to a group of people and these people are the disciples of christ who will then spread the message to other people around right so it is a retelling of the moses is received of law from god on sinai right so it is a retelling of the law it is a retelling of the moses law uh, or mosaic law which he does from the mount again the sermon in matthew is elaborated in the narrative in of matthew in key ways right so uh, the sermon although it ends at one point of course we've not really looked at the end of the sermon but it uh, you know the teachings from there or the message from there carries on two other uh, chapters as well right after the sermon finishes in the gospel the sermon is constantly referred to or the ideas of the sermon are constantly referred to in the gospel of matthew so in matthew the sermon is self consciously intertextual right this is what we are looking at what do we mean by intertextuality that a text or a book that we have in front of us is referring to another text right and it uh, is picking up lines or quotes or you know it is constantly in reference with the other text so it is intertextual though uh, two texts are uh, you know talking uh, referring to each other so the sermon is self consciously intertextual right so also we saw that the sermon is referring to the old testament it is referring to the um law of moses right therefore it is intertextual and this is uh, you know this happens with each and every line of the sermon so the resonances must be taken into account right so therefore you know what does the or original old testament mean and what does the new testament mean this is what we uh, kind of see that intertextuality is also a literary quality that we see in the sermon on the mount now the sermon also fits nicely into the aristotelian rhetorical form right aristotle was a greek philosopher right who is the disciple of plato and plato was the disciple or the student of uh, socrates right so uh, aristotle we'll be talking about aristotle and plato in our next class but aristotle talks about the format or the form of the rhetoric how does a rhetoric function right rhetoric is a form of oration right so uh, how do you develop that rhetoric that is what aristotle gives and it is said that the sermon fits into the rhetorical form that aristotle gives right so uh, an argument if you uh, put it in simpler terms a rhetoric is an argument right so in that argument what is, what should be the structure of that argument is what uh, aristotle talks about and this structure is 
uh, you know uh, what the sermon on the mount also fits into so jesus appeals to commonly accepted facts so the structure if you see the structure of the argument as aristotle puts it this is the same structure that it follows um jesus appeals to commonly accepted facts uh, so uh, he says that th these are the facts these are this is the hypothesis that we are having right then you have the intro that is given right uh, the introduction to uh, the arguments that are presented then he makes a proposition statement that you know this is what i propose so you have heard it is the old law it is the uh, reference that he is building on it is the narration of fact then he says um, on the basis of that fact on the basis of that old thing he says but i tell you now this is the proposition that he is making that this is what i propose now gives examples as we seen he also gives examples and use this a sort of recursive self referential out outline so he refers to a uh, an outline right he is constantly in dialogue and he clarifies elaborates gives examples of key terms and then finally if you look at the sermon towards the end it uh, kind of gives us emotional message emotional call to action and this is the structure of a good rhetorical argument that aristotle also talks about that if you want to have a good argument if you want to present your case nicely to somebody then you have to follow the structure you have to make references to old things then uh, establish facts you have to give your introduction on the basis of that you have to uh, then make your uh, proposal what you are trying to say then you have to give examples and you have to use a particular outline build the body around it give examples explain key terms that you're using and finally in your conclusion you have to give uh you know some sort of an emotional call to action so that people are really uh you know um they are they try to act on what you're they're convinced by your argument now in the uh, sermon we have the window to jesus's aims as a player in history right so we have understood or, or of course i think you have understood that jesus is also a player in history right we have to understand it in the larger historical background which will make clear to us you know what uh, is really jesus trying to do and if jesus conceives of his kingdom as a people in a place with a king and a culture then the sermon can be conceived of not merely as ethical or theological discourse but as a strategy right so this is something that we can understand that we can implicitly gather infer from what is happening although jesus is saying outwardly explicitly that i am not trying to you know take over um i'm only correcting i'm only healing i'm only preaching but you understand you know that this could also be conceived as a strategy that he wants you know this kingdom of god that he's trying to establish with him as the king with him as the master right and he wants disciples as men who believe in him therefore you can also see that you know uh, in a sociological historical way it he is also building an opposite sort of uh, viewpoint and uh, a different uh, sort of set of people that obey him so the sermon includes some aspects of how to appropriately maintain the reputation of god's people in an honor shame culture with competing strategies for acquiring status with the meta group of the roman world right so you can understand that the sermon also works in that way i'm not going to you know uh, uh, explain all of that now because we are running out of time so just look uh, let me just probably look at your uh, questions of course these key points that you are you know that i've put in here are again uh, you know something that we've kind of read uh, now the antithesis what do i mean by the antithesis and the structure uh, antithesis means uh, an oppositional statement that is made right so this is what we have already said that you have heard is the statement that is made and an oppositional statement is made by but i say unto you right so this is what is uh, the structure of the arguments that are presented and matthew is known for the antithetical or the oppositional structure of his writings 
So uh, the antithetical or the oppositional structures, it ha helps to show the kind of attitude and behavior that is required by Jesus in the life of his disciples. And it demands that the ethical standards of Jesus surpass those th that of uh, mosaic laws without contradicting the Torah or the mosaic law. Right, so uh, it sh shows that, uh, you know, Morality wise, Jesus is surpassing the standards of what is given in the Mosaic law, although he's not abolishing the Mosaic law because he con sorry, constantly refers to it also. So in the second, uh, again, we have no direct evidence of Matthew's authorship for this. This is again de uh, a debate that you know goes on, although the text is at ascribed to Matthew, but we do not know whether this was uh, you know, for sure written by Matthew. Now, of course, we understand that the Jews had been under a foreign rule. I've, you know, talked about this and, uh, you know, how does it really help in uh, them understanding the different opacities? Okay, class, so I'll just go on to your questions now in the last few minutes of class to see, uh, you know, how, uh, if you have anything, any clarifications. For this unit, you can refer to your study material and I'll also be sending over the PPT to you and that should be fine, right? In terms of the book that you want to refer. Adultery, of course, as we said, means, you know, having an illegal sexual uh, union with another person outside of marriage. Huh. So somebody is, uh, yeah, so we need not refer to chapter six and seven because we have only chapter five as a part of our course, right? So in chapter five, we have verses one to 48, which is what we covered in class today. Uh, and uh, they have, you know, chapter six and seven, which is given to you in your material as well, but it is not really a part of your course. So you would not be asked questions from chapter six and seven. You would be asked questions only from what is a part of your syllabus, which is chapter five verses one to 48, right? So. Uh, it depends on you whether you want to cover, uh, you know, the succe uh, successive part or not. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms, a lot of you are asking about, you know, colleges reopening. I am not sure about that. You will get a notification anytime, you know, uh, such a news is there. Um, then somebody is also asking uh, this, whether, you know, uh, whether Christ came as a Masiha and Jews did, uh, a lot of Jews that didn't recognize him, right? So what I'm, I've been trying to say class is that, you know, this sort of, we have to understand uh, what time, what historical context is Christ also coming from? What he's saying can be best explained in the terms of, you know, that critical, uh, that historical critical point that he's, uh, you know, making his arguments in. So we said that, you know, uh, he is actually talking about faith and correction of faith and healing and preaching uh, rather than, you know, uh, a sort of a um, different military rule or he's not really, you know, challenging um, the Roman Empire in terms of, you know, uh, taking it over by violence, right? But he's posing a threat to the Roman Empire by becoming their more popular reader, uh, sorry, leader. This is what you can interpret, you know, uh, or use in your interpretations as something uh, which can help you understand how literature or text really work, right? It is not about what they say, uh, you know, or what they say explicitly, but also about um, what is, you know, what is their aim um, in an implicit sort of way? What are they trying to achieve uh, without actually saying it out loud, right? So probably, you, you know, uh, if he did not say that he was the Matiha or the son of God, then why would people listen to him? How, what, what authority did he have, right? So in that way, you can probably understand, you know, what kind of uh, uh, literature is building up here. Moses is one of another, you know, uh, religious figures who is 
uh, given was the saint and was uh, you know who receives the message from god in form of the 10 commandments which are given in the old testament of the bible and this is you know this is the basic okay class if you have any other questions please type them out soon we are we've you know completed the class and in terms of whatsapp group uh i am not an admin uh, right i cannot add you up uh, and i cannot also invite you via the link but of course you know if you have the number of other students in your class or if you are in contact please try to contact them and get yourself added into the whatsapp group right class so this was about you know the bible uh, questions that we have and uh, the bible units that we had and i hope this is clear to you i'll be sending over the ppt to you and uh, i think you can refer to it again to clarify i have not really because we were running out of time i've not i've only covered what was there in syllabus and not covered the entire sermon on the month right so this is what you can refer to um okay so we cannot really know for sure that uh did jesus already know whether he want to uh, whether he would be killed but of course you know uh, he probably he did not know uh, you know uh, of course i do not want to be making any sort of blasphemous statements uh, at the risk of offending somebody's sentiments but in terms of the literature that we have uh, we can say that jesus is, knows that he is the martyr right that he is the son of god and he will be you know he'll be mart he'll be martyred for the sake of uh, you know for the sake of uh, his uh, he'll be saving humanity and he'll be saving humanity with his blood right but in the sense that you know um, did do we gather it from the sermon on the mount no right we do not know uh, for sure but there is a hint to it right uh, that he's uh he is already talking about persecution that people will be killing him people will be killing his disciples for the message that they are spreading so in a sense he understands it uh as a threat also uh, you know so we can understand it both ways as you know something that is a part of fate right that he knows that he is fated to die he will be killed for saving humanity and on the basis of also his action right that he is spreading a message that is challenging the roman empire and therefore he will be uh, killed by them right so in both these ways you can understand this uh, thing so now um, the most sublime treatment of the great mystery of human suffering is the theme of book of job uh so the book of job we discussed yesterday but you know just to uh, probably finish it up uh, what we are seeing here is that uh, you know human suffering it, i cannot really summarize probably you know nitika uh, you can uh, contact me personally for this question because i kind of uh, you know finished with the book of job and i cannot be answering uh, in such a short while now uh right so in the next class uh, on the first of february we'll be uh, doing unit 5 plato and aristotle and this that would be you know our final uh, my final class with you guys right so for iliad for you know any kind of doubts from book of job and for iliad and all of this we do not uh, you know you should have asked your questions in those classes but uh, now what you can do is probably message me regarding those questions and i can answer those questions because you know uh doing a text if you have any questions about the book of uh, about uh, you know the sermon on the mount you can write them down otherwise for any other questions from any other books you can probably message me otherwise right so in the next class on 1st of february we'll be doing plato and aristotle thank you class i hope this was clear to you and uh, you know uh, so i'll be ending the class now if you have any other things to say uh ecl classes of 2 and 3 i think another teacher was assigned for those uh, so probably they'll be taking those classes 
yeah so christianity originates from the jewish religion uh, right of course there are parallels between uh, you know uh, a or uh, the abraham and you know the uh, sort of ideas ideology that we're talking about and also some of the saints that are you know common to both religions right so in the next class we'll be doing plato and aristotle i've already clarified that okay right class so uh, this is all that i had to do uh, in terms of this particular unit and i'll be sharing the ppt as i said and this is the end of uh, okay so uh, i think you know no other doubts are there now so i'll be ending the class thank you and um, okay